This week on Wealth Track, a financial thought leader and money manager who says you are not totally diversified until the three dirty words of finance are in your portfolio. AQR Capital Management's Cliff Asness explains what they are next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Rosalind P. Walter. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Get a comfortable seat, take out your notepads, and be prepared for a graduate level seminar on investing, mostly in layman's terms, but just in case I am providing some definitions. Our guest this week is a financial thought leader with an academic and research bent. He is Clifford Asnes, the managing and founding principal of AQR Capital Management. AQR stands for Applied Quantitative Research. Asnes and several of his teammates are what are known as quants, and I'll define that in a moment. Asnes co-founded AQR in 1998, the global investment management firm which runs hedge funds, mutual funds, and a diversified collection of investment strategies, has over $83 billion in assets under management, $11 billion of which is in mutual funds. Asnes, who has a PhD in finance from the University of Chicago, has received several awards for numerous financial research papers, some of which we will have on our website. So what does a quant do? Here is how the Financial Times puts it. A quantitative analyst typically combines information and techniques from economic theory, accounting, statistics, computer programming, and information technology in order to identify the proper value for a financial instrument such as a stock, bond, derivative, or other security. Well, that is as deep as I want to go, but luckily Asnes speaks plain English and was able to communicate on my level. And I started with the basics why he believes stocks are expensive and will not provide the 8% annualized returns most investors expect. He bases his lower forecasts on a valuation method devised by one of our favorite guests, Yale professor Robert Schiller's CAPE ratio, which stands for Cyclically Adjusted Price to Earnings Ratio. It is figured over 10-year periods instead of the typical PE multiple, which is based on current price and earnings. It's obvious that stocks have value and you want to use a longer term period to evaluate them. Bob's method, we've been using it for more than 10 years, so we didn't pick it because it's 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's very useful to use the same method for a long time because it doesn't let you cheat. And if you want to be a perma bearer or perma bull, one great way to do it is to keep moving your method around to whatever measure set tells you what you like um, at that time. But we've been using the same method for a long time. It's not the be all end all. Uh, it's not perfect. but. The average for this number is going to be uh, 15, 16, 17, something this is like price that. price earnings multiple, right, um, over, historically over 10 years, right? It's right now around 23, 24. So it's relatively expensive. Relatively expensive. Right. And historically, if you, if you look at every 10-year period and s divide them into, uh, into starting periods by this CAPE number, and then look at the average return in, in, in the next 10 years, the average return has been zero over inflation when starting from this level. You just said we're talking about long term now, even though so, we're, you, know, so you and I are looking at the current market and the, 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 the uh, by Bob Schiller's price earnings ratio uh, measure, it's, it's expensive. It's 22 or 23, sure. the average is 15. So that's now. But, but so, so you know, looking out, let's say five to 10 years, you still think that stock returns are gonna be lower than they have been uh, in the in the past, I think they're either going to be a little bit lower or a bunch lower. Mm -hmm. If PEs stay high, they'll be a little bit lower because you won't suffer that loss from mean reversion. Right. Um, but you're buying at a lower, at a higher, higher price rate. and a lower yield. And if they stay where they are, instead of um, what historically has been a five, six, seven percent real return over inflation, I think more like a four percent return over inflation. Inflation, you could argue what it is, but if that's a two right now, and if it stays steady. We're talking about a six instead of an eight. 
Okay. If inflation goes up, I can get to an eight, but that's not the fun way to get to an eight. <laughs> that doesn't make anyone any happier. So why do I care? I mean, you know, so, so why is this so important to understand that the returns, the real returns, that's X inflation that you're going to get from stocks, are lower than what you have been, have you, that you've expected? You care about this for planning purposes. If you have, if you're an individual with a spreadsheet at home, which I believe every individual who knows how to use a spreadsheet has tucked away somewhere, mm -hmm. of how much I have to save for retirement. One number you put into that spreadsheet is what am I going to earn on my, uh, on, on my nest egg. Right. If you are an institution, a pension fund, an endowment, and you have either obligations or you want to know what you can fund at a school that you're the endowment for, you make an assumption on what you're going to make on your investments. If you're assuming eight and the true answer is six, you're being too optimistic. So that's one of the things that how you can adjust is that you can work longer or you can save more. But hey, you're a money manager and you're running hedge funds and you're running mutual funds. You have another approach that you think that 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 we can where we can get higher returns, right? Sure. So 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 talk about uh, number one. You know what? How you think we should be adjusting our portfolio strategy and away from an over reliance on stocks, which you think sure. is dangerous, to to other strategies. Sure. Well, you are right. We do start out thinking investors over rely on stocks. They, uh, uh, if you take your famous 60-40 investor, I'm not sure anyone on earth right. actually owns the 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Thank you. Right, the benchmark. I'm, I'm not sure anyone on earth actually owns it, but we all use it as the canonical example. Mm -hmm. Bonds are also uh, expensive these days. I don't need. You, that's the last thing you need someone to come here and explain that they're lower yielding than right. normal. So it's actually a double whammy, but. The typical portfolio, if that's 60-40, it's really a stock portfolio. Stocks drive the ups, stocks drive the downs, they drive the long-term risks, they drive the long-term return. Uh, bonds are diluting the return on stocks. So we think in a lot of ways, people should be looking for other things other than just equities. Let, let me step back and tell you how we at AQR view the world of investing. Right. Uh, how do you turn a dollar today into more than a dollar tomorrow? We think of it as three ways. One is markets go up over time. Even with my rather depressing talk early on, they do. it's still 6% a year. Uh, and you still want that in your portfolio. We're not saying uh, oh, none of that. Another is alpha. You could be a complete efficient market cynic about it. You can believe you find it left and right. But it should be relatively unique. Um, it's a what do you skill, mean? Meaning it's a skill set one or a handful of managers possess. Right. But I can't explain it to you. If I possess it, I can't explain it to you in 30 seconds. Um, I can't tell you, here's a simple strategy. Uh, to pursue. It's, it's, it's very bespoke. It's very okay. customized. Also, it, you know, we can't, as individual investors, we can't rely on no, it. No, you can. You know, history has shown that basically that there are hot managers yeah, and that they cool off and there are styles working. Right. Uh, you're exactly right. So, we do think there's a middle ground between those two of strategies that are known. And when I say a strategy, I mean uh, if a hedge fund manager is doing it, it's long this and short this. If a traditional manager, and you know we do both, right. is doing it, it's overweight this and underweight this. But let me give you, I'll give you a bunch of examples. Uh, academic research has taught us a lot. Cheap things beat expensive things over time. It was originally found for individual stocks. Uh, we and others have extended it to markets around the world, to bond markets, to currencies, to commodities. Momentum. And, and actually, Ben Graham could have told you that as ben, well ben, in the 20s and did, but yes. Sometimes. I come clean before someone says that and says, I don't claim to have discovered this. And I point out Ben Graham would roll over in his grave if I tried to pretend I or the academics in the 80s when a lot of this was studied. Right. But, 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 but the study, it's, it's actually panned out. It's actually been proven to be a good strategy is has, to buy cheap. It has. And what I'm talking about is a little bit different than the Ben Graham approach mm -hmm. in that the Ben Graham approach, which a lot of people have practiced successfully, I'm certainly not putting down that approach, it's much more of a systematic thing. If you go around the world and buy the 500 cheapest stocks on an average of 10 of your favorite measures, and you come up with similar ones to me, price to earnings, sales, cash flow, whatever your favorites right. are, and short, let's pretend we're hedge fund managers now, the 500 worst, there's been a, a fairly reliable, and when a, when a statistician like me says reliable, I mean two out of three years. If your mechanics had reliable like this, you'd fire your right. mechanic. But, but two out of three years is actually really a fairly good, great right? investment. It's really good, right, in the investment world. Mm -hmm. Where cheap has beaten expensive. That's a little bit different, and that's what was really studied in the 80s. Fahm and French were among the first to study this. I added some uh, to, to this literature. Uh, it's grown over time. 
And that has held up. But so value is one, mm -hmm. momentum is another. Uh, I, and it feels like the opposite of value, right? Yeah, it, cer it certainly does. Because momentum, I think, is being short term. It, and it, it, I would say it's shorter term. Okay. The momentum that has been successful in both the academic literature and I think in real life for at least the 20 years I've been, been looking at it is more like six to 12 month momentum. It's not super high frequency to use a buzzword today. It's that things that have been going up over what I call the short to medium term tend to keep going. Now, six to 12 months, that's kind of your months. window for momentum. And, and, I, and, I, and actually, as, as we're talking, when you, when you look at the strategies that you employ, value is one and momentum is another at AQR as well. So this is And your... those two often disagree. If, if you want to get full geek credentials, you refer to them as negatively correlated. Mm -hmm. uh, but, they, but they often disagree because something that has been going up a lot in the last year is often expensive. Right. But what if the 12th most expensive thing has finally started to give it up a bit. Maybe it was the most expensive thing a year ago. Maybe that guy is both expensive and has bad momentum. That's a candidate for an underweight or a short when these things are great. Other things that, and, and this is, uh, AQR has contributed a lot to this, but this is not mm -hmm. unique to us. This no, is right. a giant mm -hmm. literature yeah. uh, on this. Uh, two other very big things we believe in are uh, defensive, uh, high quality, l low beta, meaning low, you know, when the stock market moves, doesn't move very much. Other forms of quality are things like profitable companies. The, systematically, in the same way, I will never talk about you know, your, your favorite individual stock, but systematically, stocks that protect you have actually outperformed their risk level. So, and and the, don't those overlap with value? You know, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it is okay that things overlap. And you know what people like me do when we write papers on these things? We literally try to answer the question, is the overlap drive in all of this, or is there anything new to this? And it turns out there is some overlap, but, there's, but you really want both. Every, think of it this way, every measure is imperfect. Just so, so, I, so, so what is defensive then? I mean, what makes an investment defensive? A, a, a defensive stock, the simplest definition, you can broaden it, would be a low volatility, a stock that doesn't bounce around much, uh, or a low beta stock, it's often referred to. One that when the market moves up, it moves up 80% as much and moves down 80%. So I know you don't talk stocks, but is there a classic example of a, of a defensive stock? Well, I will give you a classic example and then I'll shoot it down. Is that okay? Yes, certainly. Uh, most people think about industries when they think about this. They think about utilities yes. as the classic example of defensive and real cyclicals or technology is the classic example. You, you know, I'm always talking about papers we write. It's, it's, it's oddly my first love is still writing these things. But myself and two colleagues have just written a paper saying that if you remove the industry bet entirely, meaning we take about 50 industries and buy the defensive half of that industry, it works better. Oh, interesting. The industry bet is actually a, a part of it, but you don't need to make the industry bet. So can I come up with one stock example? I will fail at that like I fail every time you ask me <laughs> uh, uh, about it. But in general, buying things that are cheap, buying things that have started to get better, and buying things that can protect you, which is related to cheap, you're right, but not the same. Right. It, the best asset in the world has all of those. And there are other things we look for at AQR. That's not the be all end all, but I'm giving you no, the so biggies. Th th these are right, so these are the big themes. Yeah. So uh, you know, one of the things that when you and I had talked earlier, you talked about that, that it's very important to diversify your portfolios and, your, and these are strategies that enable you to diversify because momentum is not correlated with value and whatever. And, and when you do them in a long short way, neither is correlated with the market. So, 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 you know, most of us, we hear long, short, and we think, okay, this is fine for Cliff Asnes to talk about AQR Capital, but, you know, I'm, I'm just a regular guy or gal, and there's no way that I can do long, short. So what are the accessible diversifiers to, to you know, to the average person? Uh, I think you, you want to go out there and look for funds that are constructing themselves uh, in some way where they're taking out some of the market risk and betting on something else. I've just very parochially given you the things I believe in. Right. I don't think I've figured out the whole world. There are probably plenty of other examples. But finding you know, a small, tiny tilt that's mainly still equity market risk is probably not going to get the job done in a world where equities are going to return lower. Maybe it'll be slightly better. But pretty much anything you believe in, so it can apply to any manager, that's, that, that is done in a fund form, and increasingly you can do this. You can create a hedged fund. We, um, Notice I said hedged fund, not hedge fund. Right, Because I'm talking about um, uh, uh, regular old-fashioned old mutual funds are, are perfectly viable for this. Uh, we joke at AQR, and it's not just a joke, 
that there are three dirty words in finance. Um, George Carlin used to have seven you couldn't say on TV. As a side point, you now can say six of them, and I'll leave that to the <laughs> viewer's imagination. Three is a better number for Three television. is a better number. Um, three dirty words of finance are leverage, derivatives, and shorting. Right. And, of course, they're scary. And first, let me say, they really are scary. Yes. Um, we think Leverage having debt is, having has, debt is a scary. disaster if you had too much um, of it during the financial it, it, crisis. Absolutely. Shorting can get you in trouble, certainly if you concentrate in an individual name. Um, derivatives, if, certainly if you don't understand right. uh, what you're doing. Uh, this will be a very general statement, but the worst use for these things, so it's given them their worst name, if you ask me, is twofold. It's levering, and often done with derivatives and whatnot, a bad bet to try to make it into more money. And let me give you the example. If I sat here and told you stocks are going to return less than normal, which I did, someone can come along and say, well, I can fix that for you. Um, and let me make the math easy on myself. When I, on TV, I can't do math any better than someone who's not a quant. Let's say they're half as good as normal. Mm -hmm. Someone comes along and says, I'll just lever it two to one. Right. First of all, they're not wrong. They did return. The, your expected return has gone up, has doubled. The only problem is, of course, they've also doubled their risk. Right. The and downside. that can be a total disaster. And the other dangerous use of these things is obfuscation, particularly in derivatives. Uh, the, I, I, not that, I, I'm not a big regulation guy, that won't surprise you, but I will give people advice that there's, there's no particularly great or pressing need for super complicated mm -hmm. derivatives. But the basic ones. Such as? Financial futures. Mm -hmm. um, short selling an individual stock, which is not a derivative, mm -hmm. but it's my third uh, dirty mm -hmm. word. Right. The re the, when these three things are used not to lever up a bad bet to try to make as much money as the past, not to obfuscate a complicated bet, but to create a new return and risk, and I say both, there's still a risk, that wasn't there before. Long, cheap stocks with good momentum and good quality characteristics that are defensive, short their opposite brethren. That's not an arbitrage. You don't make money all the time. But it's a different risk than the stock market that we believe pays you to do far more often than it doesn't. So when these techniques are used in moderation to diversify more, to make something that would not matter, now matter a little bit, then we think they can be a force for good. The typical diversifiers are, for instance, gold. Uh, I mean, cash is considered to be a diversifier, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, uh, limited partnerships. I mean, there are REITs that are you know, considered to be non-correlated. Are, are there other simpler tools that we should have or investments that we should have in our portfolios if, if we can't go the kind of the more sophisticated route? Sure. Um, you, you've managed to name four of the many things I consider myself not an expert on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, uh, but REITs are certainly a possibility. We think right. real assets uh, in general should get more play in a portfolio, and the stock market doesn't have enough of them. Um, I would buy a diversified portfolio of REITs just mm -hmm. because and that could be my expertise. I don't have spe special expertise. Right, right. Um, I do think cash, uh, even at zero, if you are, it becomes a timing situation. Um, I do not think people should all run to cash. The risk premiums are still positive. But here's where I prefer. Some people, I'll set up a straw man that you didn't ask me about. A lot of people ask me about, should I buy puts now? Um, should I go buy insurance against this uh, a market? Right, that, that decline. I think that is almost always a bad idea unless your timing is superb. Uh, puts are almost uh, options. Well, they're short term. You can, right, you can lose money on them and they're going to be expensive. They're, they're hugely and, expensive. Right. You nailed it. it what about just gold as an insurance policy against disaster? I would own a small amount in almost any portfolio. Right. Um, and, and not a large amount, but it, it, gold is true. Disaster. It's not a bad world. It's a disastrous world, insurance. So right. I would own a small amount of that. I own a small amount of REITs. Uh, but to be brutally honest, uh, without access to those three dirty words, there's not a whole lot you can do to escape from the stock market dominating your portfolio. It's most of what's out there. Greatest risks in the market or risk in the market right now, Cliff? The greatest risk in the market, which is certainly not something I'm forecasting, is I think an expensive market is more subject to, uh, to bolt from the blue bad news than a cheap market. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio. What okay. would you have us all own some of? I am, I am going to be very counterintuitive. And this is not a forecast. I'm actually picking a expensive investment, one more expensive than stock. I'm going to pick the bond market. And 
I don't want anyone to listen to your show and go, God has He's his lost forecast. It. He loves bonds. Right. Um, having said that, people understate the power of diversification. Take the 1970s. The 1970s was a disastrous period for bonds. The, the decade, a portfolio that took equal risk in stocks, bonds, and commodities, something like we might prefer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did better than all stocks. And it had way more bonds. Than, in the 70s? Than, in the 70s. One thing, commodities were strong, which helped, which in an inflationary period, which is when you're really going to see your bond disaster, is right. not a certainty, but it's not a bad bet, I think. Second, the power of diversification is that strong that having three different horses, even if one doesn't work, you know, if you commit yourself to diversification, the negative, the glass is empty, half empty a way to view it is you're always in the worst thing, but the glass half full way is you're always in the best thing. It turned out to be commodities that decade. If you look over the long term, we think balanced risk, even when rates mildly rise, we look at periods from the 40s to the 80s. There was a, you know your interest rate, uh, they mildly rose, and then they shot up in the early 80s, and then they've been coming down ever since right. very recently. Right. Even over that rising period, having a relatively equal amount of risk in bonds, not even dollars, work better mm -hmm. than traditional approaches. So this is not a short-term forecast. I'm certainly not sitting here telling your viewers, here's an undervalued asset. But, but don't abandon bonds but and always have a portion in your portfolio. Exactly. And I love it because it's counterintuitive. and It gives me a chance to beat to death what is almost always our most important theme, diversification beats timing. Cliff, to get back to real basics, so we just mentioned three different asset classes, diversification, commodities, stocks, bonds. So should those be the three foundations of our, you know, our investment stool? Well, the short answer is yes, but I always give the slightly longer answer. They are three biggies. Uh, but a few of the things that I, I give honorable mention to are inflation-protected bonds, which in some action, some big movements. They look a lot like regular old government bonds. But you can easily imagine, and we've seen times, where they behave quite differently. They are inflation protected. So if we ever hit a period of, of, of real inflation, you, they would have to act differently. Which we will at some point. At some but, point. but right now they're very unpopular, so this is probably a good time sure. to buy them. Uh, it, it, it very well might be. Again, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I avoid all attempts uh, uh, of you to trick me into timing something. Uh, except, I'm joking. Except value. You do pay a lot of attention to value. We, we so do. We do. We do. The we prices do. that you pay. We, we okay. do. But we always do. We don't right. say now is no, the No, no, right. Um, so uh, those are the three big legs of the school, but stool, but inflation-protected bonds. And then another thing I give honorable mention to, which I, which I want to sneak in, is making sure you're very global. Um, and that's another thing that might be unpopular now, particularly for U.S. investors, because the U.S. has done better than global portfolios, particularly this year. We have no idea. Speaking for myself, we have, uh, I have no idea, and I think the royal we of the world has very little idea in the, in the short term or the next year which part of the world is going to do better. Global diversification protects you over the long term. We've written on this. We wrote a paper that said global diversification works with parentheses eventually, meaning it doesn't do a great job in the short term. If everything crashes, if the world crashes, it's going to affect everything. Right. But global diversification to us is much more about the chance that it turns out that your country, whatever country that is, is the Japan of the 1990s. You are the world's basket case. Maybe that'll be the poster child for a long time because it happened recently. I don't mean to pick on Japan. But when we go do the study, every country, to some degree, maybe not as bad as Japan was then, but to some degree has been the Japan for a while, for long periods. So diversifying globally takes away the chance that you have all your eggs in the wrong basket. Cliff, as I said, it is always a treat to have you on Wealth Track. So thank you always so much fun. for thank you. being with us from AQR Capital Management. <music> At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is consider quants. Specifically, consider adding mutual funds to your portfolio run by a reputable and leading edge quantitative research and strategy firm. We have had two masters of the art on Wealthtrack over the years. One is this week's guest, Cliff Asnes. His firm, AQR Capital Management, runs several mutual funds offering different strategies for portfolio diversification. The other is finance professor Andrew Lowe, who heads up MIT's Laboratory for Financial Engineering and is the founder and chief investment officer of Alpha Simplex Group, which runs several funds under the Natixis ASG name. In Lowe's words, they are designed to help investors achieve greater diversification than traditional stock and bond funds while actively controlling risk and liquidity. 
Both firms are highly regarded by investment professionals. Well, next week we have a special treat for you, a rare interview with legendary deep value investor Marty Whitman, founder of the Third Avenue Value Funds. His motto is buy safe and cheap. If you wish to see past WealthTrack interviews, go to our website and check out our extra feature for personal insights from our guests, as well as research and articles we find particularly compelling. Also, feel free to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. In the meantime, have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Rosalind P. Walter.